where you've been, what you've done, and what you have done to you. You are the part of the journey that God used. Uh, how many of you guys enjoyed the Brass Tax series? that we just got done with. Wasn't that amazing? Getting to hear all the different, how many of you enjoyed getting to hear all the different core pastors being able to speak and to preach and there's like nobody, nobody's happy, nobody was happy about that? It was, it was pretty cool. Uh, I, I enjoyed it for the first like four weeks. It was awesome because I didn't have to, uh, you know, uh, really prepare or anything for a week. But after about four or five weeks, I was itching already and I was like, I gotta, I gotta get back home. So, uh, so. This week we are starting a new series called Mission Control. Mission Control. I believe that 2018, as I believe every year is the same way, is a launch year for you. And, and I believe that's a launch year. There, there are numbers that are very important in the Bible. And I don't think that everything is a number. But, but, but there are certain numbers that kind of get my attention. And eight, eight is one of those numbers. And eight is a number that means new beginnings. And every time I hear the words new beginnings, I hear the word launch. Launch, like blast off, like God wants to launch you. And, and that means a lot to me because, you see, when I was a little kid, all I could think about being after wanting to be a garbage man, which, true story, my mom is there, she's laughing because she knows this is true. When I was a little kid, the only thing I ever wanted to be was a garbage man. There was nothing cooler than that big, huge trash compactor truck rolling up and just the, the two forks would just come out and would, you know, stab the sides of the garbage can and it would dump the garbage can over and put it back down. And I thought it was the most amazing thing. Transformers were my favorite cartoons in the world. And I swore that that garbage trash compactor truck was a transformer. And I wanted to drive the transformer. So that's all I wanted to be. But after that, I wanted to be an astronaut because my aunt worked for NASA. She still works for NASA. And I was obsessed with everything space shuttles. My aunt would get me uh, patches and would send me mission patches, and I was just obsessed with it. And so here I am as a believer, and when I think about launch, I just have a picture of that space shuttle. And, but, you know, I studied everything about space shuttle launches and all of those things, and, you know, years go into a space shuttle launch. Years. They don't just show up one day and go, hey, guys, let's, let's get on a space shuttle and let's go to outer space. What are you doing today? Nothing. Well, Fred, Let's just get on the space shuttle. Let's go. All right, Fred. All right, Jim. Let's go. Right? No, it doesn't work like that. It's like years go into planning this because anytime you are going to strap yourself to a soda can attached to two rockets and send you up out of the atmosphere into a place where you can't breathe, you had better be prepared. And so after all of that planning, all of that preparation, all of that training, finally they get ready for launch. And when they get ready, three days before, they send the space shuttle out to Cape Canaveral, get it ready and aligned and prepared, and they send over authority for the launch to a place in Houston called Mission Control. And Mission Control Make sure that everything is ready. Every little minute detail is ready for launch. And if there's even one thing that isn't up to the standards or the specifications for a safe launch, they can't do it. And I believe that God wants to launch each and every one of you as he does every single year because God never goes backwards. He never plateaus. He never reaches a place where he says there's no higher place to go. No matter where you are in life right now, God is somewhere higher. He has called you to reach and he wants to send you as soon as he is good and willing and ready as long as you're ready for it too. And so God, just like the space shuttle, he's your mission control, and there are some standards that he wants you to reach. And so just like that space shuttle, just like before launch, mission control does something called systems 
check. And today I want to start off this series by talking about systems check. That God wants to, wants to teach you what his system check looks like. And it's not just a one-time thing. It's an everyday thing. Because his mercies are new every morning. His grace is new every morning. His will starts all over again in your life every single day. And no matter how you might fall short or how you might succeed the day before, when you wake up in the morning, you are ready, good, and gone to launch all over again. And so you need to know what what it's like to system check yourself every single morning. Man, y'all, it feels good to be home. But before we jump into this, there's some very special people in the house I want to recognize. So Sean and Jessica, if you'll stand up. Pastor Sean, Pastor Jessica, they are the pastors of Waipuna Chapel. And they are amazing, beautiful people. And, and, and you know, the greatest compliment I can ever give people, and, and, and when you're in ministry, this is not always the case, uh, uh, sadly enough. But the, most, the, most, uh, the best thing, I, I was always taught as a teenager or, or in Bible college, I had a professor tell me the best thing you can ever call someone is a good person. And I said, why? That doesn't sound so awesome, right? But what, he's, what he was saying was, in this world where we are taught to wear masks and that what we present to the world and what we present to each other, uh, each other is not always the truth of who we are, to find people of integrity that actually are who they say they are, who they present themselves as, that's the best thing you can be. And they are who they say they are. And that's the best compliment I can ever give anyone. They are amazing, great people. And so let's just honor them one more time. They're just, it was totally a surprise. I looked back and 9 o'clock was off the chain and we ran right into the, the 11 o'clock. And then all of a sudden they were standing there like two angels in the back. And I was like, what? Doth my eyes deceive me? And they were there. And so it's so awesome that they're here. They have the day off and they could be anywhere, right? And when you're a pastor and you have to be at church all the time, when it's your Sunday off, usually the last place you want to be is church. But here you guys are. So I'm so honored to have you here um, with us. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. This is a very well-known passage of Scripture. You can turn to it in your iPhone, your iPad, your page-turning Bible, any which way you got it. Uh, um, um, if you have an Android, I guess you can turn to it too. Theoretically, Jesus did die for Android lovers as well. So if you turn to your Bible app in your Android, maybe your Android will get saved today and turn into an iPhone. I don't know. Maybe it'll get sanctified today, filled with the Holy Ghost, turn into iPhone X, right? So I, I don't know. Just turn to it. Who knows what will happen, right? Uh, but, but Hebrews chapter 12, if you don't have it, uh, the beautiful thing about the 21st century, we have it for you on the screen here. But Hebrews chapter 12, I'm, li- uh, I'm, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight. Everyone say weight. That slows us down, especially the sin. Everybody say sin. Strip off the weight, but especially the sin. Did you know that every sin is a weight, but not every weight is a sin? But both conspire to keep you from being able to run your race. And you need to know, as a people of God, how to differentiate weights and sins. Every sin will slow you up like a weight, but not every weight is a sin. Sometimes it's not an issue of right or wrong. Sometimes it's something you're carrying that God told you not to carry. That so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance. Everybody say endurance. The race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes, everybody say eyes, on Jesus the champion. How many of you know that Jesus is the champion? Jesus is not working his way up to be champion. He's not fighting his way to the ranks to be champion. Jesus right now living inside of you, he's the champion. And if he's the champion and he lives in you and the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives inside of you, guess what? If he's the champion, the spirit of the champion in you, guess you're the champ too. Who initiates and perfects our faith. He's the beginning. He's the end. He doesn't need you to start it. He doesn't need you to finish it. He just needs you to fall in line. Because of the joy awaiting him. Everybody say joy. He endured the cross, 
disregarding its shame. It wasn't that he had joy in the cross. It was because he saw past the cross at what was waiting for him. And because he had the ability to discern the finish line through the clouds, through the fog, through the smoke, through the pain. Because he had the discernment to see what was on the other side. He was able to allow his sight to line up with the Father's sight. He was able to make it through everything in life. He was able to make it through his process, disregarding his shame. When you are able to see what God has before you, shame won't have any power over you. And we live in a world in which shame is the number one thing that holds you in condemnation and causes us to wear masks to everyone else. Because we will hide ourselves out of shame. But Jesus chose joy over shame. The way to defeat shame in your life and the hold and the bondage of shame in your life is joy. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy awaiting him. He endured the cross disregarding shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. And Ephesians 1 says we are already seated in heavenly places with Christ. In heaven, in the place, in eternity where there is no past, present, future. There is only the eternal now in God. You are already seated in heavenly places with Christ. Just as he is seated in the place of honor. And as I walk out this life on earth, I'm not trying to accomplish something that heaven hasn't seen accomplished in me yet. I am right now walking out on earth what is already accomplished in heaven. Doesn't it make you feel great and give you peace to know that God has already seen your end and that your end has already been seen by God? Two people. How many of you are glad that God is not trying to figure out your life along with you? But God has already seen the end from the beginning. God has already seen you. And not just seen you finish, but seen you win. And all I need to do, he did all the work. He did all the hard part. The last thing he said on the cross, not when he walked out of the tomb, on the cross when he died, when Satan thought he'd won the victory, Jesus looked and said, no, according to the sight of the entire world, I've lost. But let me tell you, it is finished. I won. And I have seen and finished your end. So today I want to talk to you briefly about five momentum-breaking areas in your life that if left unchecked, they will sabotage your momentum and your ability to launch into everything that God has called you to be. Five areas in your life that if you don't submit it to God or if you don't wake up in the morning and submit yourself to God in these areas, they will break momentum. And launches are all about momentum. It's about building momentum. It takes a tremendous amount. It takes about 80% of the fuel that the, and the power that a space shuttle will ever need to just to get off the ground. And the other 20% is to maintain orbit and to land. But, but four-fifths of all the power all the fuel that is needed is just to create momentum. It is so hard to create momentum. But it is even harder to maintain momentum. And I'll tell you why. Because when you have to create momentum, you will put all of your focus and energy into starting. But once you create some momentum... It is very easy to take your eye off the prize and in a split second lose it and have to start all over again. And Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, the one thing I need to do is I need to forget what's behind me and look forward to what's ahead because I am pressing on towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. If there's a high calling, there's a low calling. And I don't want to just reach the low calling of God my whole life and aim at low standards. 
I want to aim high, at high standards, far beyond the reach and the gravitational pull of this world. I want to reach the exceedingly abundantly above limitless destiny that Jesus Christ has called me to. And Paul says, the one thing I do is I have to let go of the past. And I want to lay that foundation for you because all of these five areas, the, the thing that you're going to have to let go of is the past. And the past is full of pleasure and pain. And it is not the pleasure and the pain of the past that is the draw to you that keeps you looking back like Lot's wife. But the, the draw of the past is its comfort. And you need to know and understand that the, that the drug of choice in America is comfort. It is not cocaine, it is not heroin, it is not meth, it is not marijuana, it is comfort. Americans love comfort. We love our comfort. We will sell out our souls to comfort. We will sell out our call to Jesus Christ for comfort. We will sell out everything for comfort. Just make it comfortable. We want destiny without discipline. We want calling without commitment. We want heaven without giving our hearts. And the comfort of the past. See, whatever your past has shaped you is what you have become accustomed to being defined by. And the past has a nostalgia to it. I'm a born-again believer, obviously. I've known Jesus fully, committed my life to him since I was 15 years old. But when I was 15 in my junior year of high school, I'll tell you what I loved. I loved rap. Which is kind of cool because I got kids now. And they've known Jesus their whole lives. And we had a party on Friday night. And it was a reveal party for Taven. Taven, you know, Jesus through Taven, whooped cancer, kicked it in the rear, sent it packing. Eight-year-old boy. And he got a make-a-wish. He got to go to Disney World. So they're leaving for Disney World in 10 days. I tried to convince him that he was wrong. He did not discern properly. He needs to go to WrestleMania. John Cena. Are you kidding me? John Cena. Go see John Cena. He looked at me. He was like, that's my make-a-wish. When you get your own make-a-wish, you can go to WrestleMania. I was like, dang, Taven. Man, that's, that's savage right there. But it was a nice little party. It was a nice little Christian party. And then the movement kids, right, the movement team, they got a hold of the karaoke machine. And then it just turned into a full-blown party with electric sliding by Amanda. Amanda, you saw her like crazy electric slide. I don't know what that was. That was, that was the most whitest white girl electric slide I've ever seen. But it was pretty amazing. And uh, if you haven't seen it, go on my Facebook. It's posted there. It's amazing. It's amazing. I love you, Amanda. I love you. I love you. I love that whole dance. Never, ever. No, but, but then, you know, my, my two musical daughters, they did this. Burning both sides of the road and I'm hoping this up in trouble. The cake came before I'm choking off the sin to be destroying every fiber I got. I need the Lord and every day I'll never make it or not. Going back to the way it was before Christ in my life. I couldn't do it, I would lose it. There's no point to the fight. You're know, writing the song for the people who don't belong. I pray away the pain of fear of all the things that we brought. Besides life is never angry and disappointment is I feel the same way, no help me stay up. I can make it to a man at the ITA Joe. And I can make it to this life in a place that is no crying. I'm dying to find you with open arms where I go. Knowing you love me and you play with me. Oh, Lord, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I'm not scared because you're holding my breath. I only fear that I don't have enough time left. Tell the world that I don't have left. Lord, please, Lord, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? You know, I really love that, that they love Jesus that way. You know, this, it's a great song with a great message, right? But, but see, I grew up in the late 80s and 90s. So I like to think that I grew up in the best era of rap ever. And as much as I hear today's music, and it sounds nice, there is a nostalgia when it comes to and when I think of rap, and I think of real rap, everybody knows what real rap sounds like. It sounds like this.
Y'all wasn't always saved. You know what this song was. Don't act all holy like you don't know this song. Right? One, two, three into the four. Snoop Doggy Dog and Dr. Dre is at the door. Ready to make an entrance, so back on up. Cause you know we're about to rip stuff up. Give me the microphone first so I can bust like a bubble. Compton and Long Beach together. Now you know you in trouble. Ain't nothing but a G. Two low down G's going. Death Row is the label that Unfadeable, so please don't try to fake this. Remember that? Y'all remember that song? Y'all act like y'all don't know. Y'all act like y'all don't know. Yeah, y'all. Y'all looking at me all funny now. You're like, are you sure this guy should be our pastor? Y'all know you were listening to that. Y'all know you all were rolling down the street last week listening to that. Come on, don't even play. Don't even play. Don't even play. All right. But see, there's a nostalgia, right? As soon as I played that song, everybody in here started bumping. You're like, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't, I'm, no, I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. I am filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm filled with the nothing but a G thing, baby. Too low. To, right? that's, I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like just pulls you back, right? The past has that effect on you. Has an effect on you. All right, look, look. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, y'all. All right, all right. I know I got, I got five things I'm going to get to real quick. Five momentum breaking areas. I know that's what you came from for, but, but look, look. Everybody stand up with me. Everybody stand up with me. Y'all know this is the real song. <laughs> now this is the story all about how. And I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there, and I'll tell you. <laughs> now this is the greatest rap song of all time. It no matter what color you are, you know the word, right? When West Philadelphia, born and raised on a playground is where I spent most of my days. Chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool out, shooting some b-ball outside of school. When a couple of guys, they were up to no good. Started making trouble in my neighborhood. Got in one little fight and my mom got scared and said, you're moving with your honey and I'm going to be like, look, there ain't no cuss words. Y'all used to watch the show. It's a clean show. Come on. Come on. Y'all can have fun. Right? Right? What is it next? A uh, whistle for a cab, and then it came near. The license plate is fresh, and it is ice in the mirror. If anything, I could say that this cab was rare, but I thought, no, forget it. You're home to Bel Air. What? I pulled up to a house about seven or eight, and I yelled to the cab, you're home, smell you later. Looked at my kingdom, I was finally there to sit on my throne. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, see, so we sanctified the rap. All right, you guys can be seated. So. So we left it on a sanctified note. But there are five areas that will, that will break your momentum. And the past has a lot to do with it because the past is what forms this connection to these five things that will constantly sabotage your momentum. And Paul says if you keep looking back at the past, you will never be able to focus, drive forward, and build the correct momentum. And everything when it comes to launching yourself into the destiny that God has called for you is all about building and not breaking momentum. So right here, he says, okay, if you're going to end up seated in heavenly places with Christ, running your race, this is what it's going to take. And number one, the first place, the first area that your systems check is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to look at is your weight level. Everybody say weight level. Okay, I'm not talking about your physical weight level, so everybody can chill right now. I'm not going to tell you go, 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 go get insanity or T25 or anything like that. I'm not going to tell you that. But I will say this. I will say this about that. I will say this. You guys know, right, about five years ago, I lost like 70 pounds, right, because I tore my Achilles tendon, gained like 60 pounds, eating pizza and all that good stuff, and, and, and I had to lose it. And this is what God spoke to me. He said, hey, stop asking me for a 100-year destiny when you're treating your body like a 40-year body. Oh. oh, man, some of you just failed the systems check just now. <laughs> some of you are like, wow, dang. <laughs> I like my pizza too much. Your weight level. He says, first thing you got to do is you got to strip off all the weight. See, you, some of us are carrying too many burdens that God never called you 
to carry. And the problem with weight, weight in and of itself is not necessarily bad. Most of the things that weigh you down or that you think about or you worry about or, or, or the burdens you carry are good burdens. They're things, they're things like, how am I going to provide for my children? How am I going to afford my house? Where am I going to get my next meal? Whatever it is. All of those things, they're, they're, they're legitimate burdens. But the problem with those burdens is just like extra weight on a space shuttle. They weigh you down. And Jesus knew this. He knew that we didn't have the capacity to carry all that weight. Some of you are being buried right now every single day. You want to reach for Jesus. You want to walk out the call he has for you. You come to church every Sunday and you say, oh, yeah, I can totally do it. And then, and, and then you go out back into the world and you get buried under the avalanche of weight. And it's the weight that's slowing you down. And Jesus knew this, so he says, hey, come to me if you're burdened and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Because he said, if you give me your worries and your burdens, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. You're going to be able to launch with the stuff that I'm giving you. You're looking at some of the things that God is asking you to do, and you're saying, no, that's too much. That's another night. That's, oh, no, I, no, I don't want to do life groups. That's all another night. I like to stay home. I like to watch Fresh Prince of Bel-Air on Nick at Night. And I like, oh, I don't want to give up that night. That's another burden. But it's better to have that burden launching you into destiny than to hold on the burden of not being able to trust God because you can't get around nobody. You can't trust nobody because you won't get yourself around the people of God in a life group. The weight. It's the weight. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, give all your worries and your cares to God for he cares for you. I love how the, the word care is in this verse twice, but it means totally different things. He says, I got to care, you got to care. But my care is different from your care. And the cares that you're really caring about, this earthly version of care is a burden, but my care is love. And I want you to trade your care, which is a burden, and give it to me and let me worry about it. And what I want you to take on is my care, which is devotion and love. And just the same way that I love you, I want you to love me. And if you can seek me with your whole heart, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the other things that you're caring about will be added to you. So the first system God's got to check in your life is your weight level. What are you carrying? I want to ask you, what are you carrying that you're not supposed to be carrying? What are you waking up every day and you're worried about, but you know God has called you not to worry about it? If you are waking up every day and you are holding on to things that God has told you not to worry about because he will provide it for you, then you are carrying extra weight. You cannot pass that system check. Number two, God has to check your sin level. Okay, so there's weight level, and weight will slow you down. Just like ankle weights on a runner will slow him down if he's running in a race. Great for training. Great to help you build up endurance. But if you try to run with those same ankle weights in the race, they'll slow you down. Weight will slow you down. Sin will bring you to a stop. Sin is weight that you cannot carry. That's why you needed a savior. You had no ability to run out your life with the weight of sin attached to you. As, as soon as sin attached itself to you, as soon as sin attached itself to Adam, you became a person that would sink and never swim. You will be a person that could never reach your destination. So Jesus says, I have to take your sin because the sin has brought you to a stop. And sin is anything that you find your identity in that is not Christ. Sin is anything you find your identity in that is not Christ. In fact, there are two words for sin in the Bible. There's the act of sin, there's the heart of sin. The act of sin is porneia, committing a sin. Porneia, it's where we get the word pornography from. 
committing sin. But, but there's another word that is the heart of sin, and it's hamartia, which means missing the mark. When you miss the mark, Christ is the mark, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. But every time I miss that mark, I, I, don't, I don't look to him. It's sin. And sin brings you to a stop. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Wow. Wow. This is the same 1 John that two chapters later, he's all like, love, 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 God is love, 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 right? And then right here, he kind of like flips the scrim a little bit, right? And he's like, if you love the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. He doesn't say that the Father does not love you. But he's saying that the Father's love that he wants to pass down to you, his version of love, which is the purest love, is not in you. It's defiled and tainted as long as you maintain even the fraction of the love of the world. For the world only offers a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievement and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Anything that pulls you away from God is sin. And sin keeps you attached to this world. As long as you love the things of this world, you will have a soul tie to this world that you will not be able to break. And you are like a ship trying to pull away from port, but you are still anchored to the pier. And it doesn't matter how many times you come to the altar and pull away. Come to the altar on Sunday, pull away. Come to the altar on Sunday, give your life to Jesus, pull away. Every time you do that, it doesn't matter because you're going to walk out of these doors. And as long as you maintain a love for the things of this world, you are going to be pulled right back to the pier of this world. That's why somebody, some of us have come to the altar 7,392 times and got saved over and over again. You want to love God? Learn to hate sin. You might still struggle with it. Not everything just falls off automatically and is honky-dory. Remember I said the drug of choice in America is comfort? We would really like God to just get rid of all of our issues right now. No, that's not always how it is. The process of walking it out can't always be easy. But you know what you have to commit to? You don't have to commit to the complete freedom from sin from the jump, but you better commit to hating sin from the jump. You cannot reach your heavenly destiny as long as you're still attached to earthly desires. Those two things are opposite forces. Number one, weight level. Number two, sin level. Number three, impatience level. Oh, oh. See, you're like, oh, I'm sanctified. I've been saved 25 years. I don't know. All my burdens belong to Jesus. Oh, no, no. Nah. I, like, I gave up smoking weed like 20 years ago. I'm fine. I don't have that kind of sin in my life. Oh, impatience. You know, everything I ever knew about the Holy Ghost, I feel, well, not everything, like 90, 99% of everything I know about the Holy Ghost, I learned when GPS was invented. <laughs> true story, true story. Uh, yeah, yeah. GPS has taught me more about what the Holy Ghost is like than anything else in life. Right? Because GPS is this amazing thing. You turn it on, you enter in an address, and a voice tells me where to go. And as addicted to comfort as we are, it's the greatest thing ever invented. I don't even have to think. I just got to listen. Or so I thought. GPS will always tell me the best route, but not always the shortest route. Because GPS is information I don't have. It has traffic patterns, 
It knows when there's an accident. It knows when traffic has slowed to a halt because it pulls all of this user information. And, and it's privy, and it will, it will create the best route for me based on all of that information. And sometimes I'll look at GPS and I'll say, wait, that's not the shortest way. I know a shorter way. I don't know why it's telling me to go this way. So then I go, well, I'm going to go this. I'm going to go my shorter way because GPS obviously doesn't know what it's talking about. And 45 minutes later, sitting on the poly, waiting on a three-car pile up, I'm like, oh, I should have listened. Just kidding. That, that's a bad example because everybody knows that for whatever reason, Maui has decided that there's only going to be one way to Lahaina. No alternative route. Same two lanes. <laughs> but GPS will route you. And I'll tell you my most impatient moment anytime I'm on a road trip and GPS is on. It's when the GPS tells me now go straight 15.7 miles. And I get about seven and a half miles in. And I start looking at GPS. I'm like, is it time for me to turn yet? Can I GPS? Should I turn yet? GPS, where is it? Oh, okay, seven and a half miles. Oh, okay, GPS, is it time now? Oh, no, 7.2 7 miles. Oh, man, it's got to be like 15 minutes ago. Uh, GPS, should I turn now? 6.8 miles, right? And you get really impatient. You want to turn off. And finally, you're like, okay, maybe I should just turn off. Maybe GPS missed the turn. And then you turn off. And then that voice that was so nice and polite to you when you started, start root now. Turn left. On Hina Avenue. All of a sudden, she gets judgmental. She's like, rerouting. Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. Each one of those dot, dot, dots is like a judgment against you. It's like, you should have listened. Don't turn next time. Follow my directions. Dot, 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 dot. And it reroutes you, and then it has to take you all the way around, and now it took you longer because you should have listened. But this is the thing about GPS that makes me so impatient. GPS won't talk to me when I'm just supposed to go straight. GPS only talks to me when it's time to turn. And as long as I'm supposed to go straight, I can ask it all I want. I can talk to it all I want. I can beg for directions all I want, but it just wants me to go straight, so it's not going to say nothing. See, too many of us are asking the Holy Ghost, should I turn now? Should I turn now? Should I turn now? Should I turn now? Should I get off now? I mean, how long should I go to life group? How long should I do disciple class? How long should I meet with that pastor? How long should I do, how long should I go do this? I mean, how long should I not hang out with my friends? How long should I, how, how long, should I get off now? Should I get off now? Should I get off now? And we get impatient, and we turn off at the wrong point. And you're like, well, the Holy Spirit didn't say nothing to me. And the Holy Spirit is saying, of course, I'm not saying anything to you. I just want you to go straight. And God has to every day check your impatience level. Left unchecked, human beings are apt to turn off at any point. We're just like that. James 1 says, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Did, did, did you know that troubles in your life are not punishment for your past, they're preparation for your future? God is not punishing you for something he already died for and forgave. And whatever consequences he deems necessary for you to walk out, they are not to punish you or he feels like he's got to pay you back or something. He is doing this because there is something in the lesson that is forming something complete in you. And that word for endurance is a combination. It's a Greek compound word. And that the root word 
means to remain or be stable. Now, to me, when I think about endurance, remaining or enduring, that, that, that's what that word means. But he doesn't just say to endure or remain. He adds a prefix to it, hypo. And hypo means under, to remain under. The kind of patience God wants you to exhibit is not an independent patience or a stubborn patience where you hold on for the sake of holding on, saying I'm just not going to give up and I'm going to do it by myself and nobody's going to help me. I don't need nobody. I'm going to do this on my own. No, that the, the, the kind of endurance that Paul is saying is what will get you complete is the kind that is submitted. Remaining under remaining under Christ remaining under the spirit remaining under authority in your life that's what's going to help you remain but impatient people are constantly stuck in a cycle of starting but never finishing if you find yourself and you can look back on your life and see yourself starting all the time with great intentions but never finishing this is when you need to let God check. Some place, somewhere along the way, you're getting off and turning when he wants you to stay straight. Number four, after the weight level, sin level, impatience level, there's a distraction level. Going back to GPS, you know what is the only time I miss GPS's direction? when I'm not paying attention, <laughs> which is quite often. <laughs> oh, I got to go 7.5 more miles. All right. Turn the music up. I'm like listening to the music, looking around all over the place, talking to the person next to me. Next thing I know, you know what I hear? Rerouting. Dot, dot, dot. Why aren't you paying attention to me, Chris? Right? Distractions. Distractions create detours to destiny. And if you're not careful, your detours will turn into dead ends. Nothing will choke out your ability to hear the instruction of God and to build momentum in your life quite like distraction. Distractions lead you on tangents, pull you off the momentum that, you, that, that God has created in you and will grind you to a halt. If you're distracted, you'll miss the direction every single time. And finally, number five, the perspective level. Your perspective. Your perspective drives your reality. The earth has always been round. But up until about 600 years ago, people thought the world was flat. And if you look today, there's still some people who think the earth's flat. And, you know, it didn't matter that the earth was always round. As long as they believed that the earth was flat, they would make all of their decisions based on a flat earth. They would never sail beyond the horizon. As long as your perspective is skewed, it will drive your reality, and it will be your reality. So after you've laid aside the weight, after you've laid aside the sin, after you've run your race patiently, after you've focused on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and said, I refuse to be distracted. You've got to have a perspective like Jesus. You've, you've got to be able to see the joy in every season of your life. He said that he saw the joy. He didn't see the cross. He saw the joy. That's what God got him, that's what got him through. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. 
In everything, there's a season. Every area of life, there's a season for you to walk through. There's a time for every activity under heaven. There are no activities that God can't redeem. And, you know, he goes through this list of seasons. And some of the seasons are really good. A time to dance. A time to be born. A time to celebrate. A time to plant. A time to harvest. A time to heal. A time to love. But, but, but mixed in there are some other seasons that he says ju- are just as purposeful as the good ones. Some of them are, are, are a season to die. A season to kill. A season to tear down. A season to cry. A season to mourn. I just went through a season of mourning for the last year and a half. A season to scatter. Some of us have felt scattered. A season to reject. Wow, think about that. You mean that season of rejection I went through in my life? It wasn't purposeless. It wasn't just a lost season. A season to quit. Specifically quit looking. You mean that season where I just walked away from church for 15 years and I quit looking for God and I did things my own way and I made all kind of bad decisions and then, uh, and then now I came back and I go, man, I wish I would have looked for God that time. You mean that God can redeem that, that, there, that there, there was a time and a purpose for that? A season to rip apart. That season where I felt like my life was ripped to shreds. A season to hate. Wow. And a season for war. You mean uh, this whole time, from the minute I was born, I have been fighting my whole life. And everyone in church tells me if I come to Jesus, I won't have to fight. But if you live my life, you would know. I've had to fight. And you're telling me there was purpose in it? I want to tell you there wasn't just a purpose in it. Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes 3.1 says there's a purpose for it. But in Ecclesiastes 3.11 on the other side, Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith. And there's a purpose that starts you. But at the end, it says, yet God has made everything. He just got done talking about all these seasons, some good, some bad. And he says, yet God has made everything beautiful in its own time. In other words, every season has its own appointed time. And there is purpose at the beginning. Jesus saw the joy set before him because he saw the beauty waiting on the other end of the purpose. And if you allow your perspective to be skewed, you're going to get distracted by the process. You're going to get impatient with the journey. You're going to miss the mark, get locked up. And it'll stop you. And you'll start worrying. And get weighted down by the burdens of life. But there is a beauty waiting for you. as long as you just follow the process. And God has created a momentum for your life. You're in him now. There are no limits to who you can be in him. There is not a devil in hell 
There is not a bondage or an addiction or an alcohol, and there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God, and there is nothing that can keep you from reaching every height that he's called you to reach, and there is nothing that can hold you back from being what he wants you to be. But, 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 but you've got to allow him to check your systems. What burdens am I carrying? What sin am I holding? Where am I being impatient? Where am I distracted? And where is my pers perspective skewed? I want you to stand up with me. I know we took a little bit of time. That's what happens when I don't preach for 11 weeks here. But I want you to close your eyes. And we're going to do our first system check right now. And I don't believe you have to wait for the calendar to tell you that 2018 has started before you start living in the things that God has ordained for you. In 2018, you can start your preparation right now. My favorite rapper, NF, has this amazing song. It's called Green Light, and it, the chorus says, all I see is green lights. All I see is green lights. The Bible puts it this way. All the promises of God are yes and amen. All I see is green lights. That means, you know what the beautiful thing? I love when I'm driving and I time it exactly right. When you're driving down Punene and there's like light after light after light after light. And that moment where you just timed it right and they turn green. And you know what happens? You don't have to stop your momentum. You just keep going. You don't have to hit the brake at all. And every one of these five points can be red lights or green lights. They can aid my momentum. They can hinder it. Where you've been, what you've done, and what you have done to you. You are the part of the journey that God knew you were going to be on.